Hi, my name is Wes. I'm one of the youth pastors here at Green Valley Church. We're so excited that you decided to join us online. Let's go ahead and join them now.
Again, thank you. How wonderful. What a morning. Uh, we do have more announcements for you. Um, keep in mind that our spring home groups have started and it's not too late to join one. So if you are interested in joining a spring home group, uh, you can sign up through our website, greenvalleychurch.com. You can also just send me an email, andrew at greenvalleychurch.com if you'd rather. Uh, so we'd lo I'd love to help you get more connected here at GVC. And then uh, coming up on Saturday, April 2nd at 9 a.m., uh, here at church, we're gonna, we've invited uh, licensed marriage and family therapist Greg McCord to come uh, talk to us. He's, gonna do, he's doing a parenting seminar called Thriving Through the Teen Years. And uh, he, he's uh, raised um, three teens himself and um, has, uh, one, he was a, a youth pastor for over 20 years. Uh, before he went into counseling. And so we are so excited to have him. Uh, I would say uh, certainly if you have a teenager, uh, you need to be here with, uh, with us. If uh, you have any kind of vested interest in a teenager, I would encourage you to sign up and come join us. Uh, you'll be glad that you did. And then Easter coming up. Uh, I know, can you believe it? it's almost time for Easter? Uh, but we are gonna, we, we're already gearing up for uh, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, so we'll have our regular services on Easter Sunday. Um, we'll also have that Thursday, we do our communion service. So I would encourage you to put that on your calendars. Uh, always, I'd say one of probably our most intimate service is that Thursday communion service. So I hope that you'll come join us for that and uh, invite some friends or some neighbors to come join us on Easter Sunday. And with that, I'm going to pray for our message. Lord, uh, we thank you for always being at work. 
We thank you that you are always at work in us and around us and around the world. And I pray that you would continue to give strength and encouragement to everybody that's here, everybody that's listening online. Lord, I pray that you would continue to give us direction and understanding. Help us to see uh, where you are already at work and help us to join you in that. Lord, I, I pray that you would be speaking to our hearts this morning. That you would be, I pray that you would be speaking through Doug as we hear from your word. Lord, we love you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. It's good to see all of you again. Uh, this morning, you guys are a little more rested after the time change last week. Now you guys are back on schedule, or it was a couple weeks ago. I'm just barely getting used to the, um, the time change, so I'm glad to have you back, and welcome to our online audience who are also following along with us this morning. Uh, it is good to be together, and we're, getting, we're winding down on our series, What Would Jesus Undo? And we're getting close to the end, uh, and, but as we, can, as we continue through the book of Luke, we continue to see how Jesus really addresses his culture and our lives in these, these rearranges, these reversals that he wants to do in our lives as well. A few years back, a church in Moberly, Moberly Missouri received a letter in the mail that had been sent over five decades earlier. The post office had no idea how it remained lost all those years. It was postmarked 1949. It had a one cent stamp on it, no zip code, written in pencil, and addressed to a pastor at that church who was no longer alive. How would you like to be the mail carrier who delivered that letter? Uh, I think this might be a little late. Um, but what was most amazing to me about the, the letter isn't how long it took for the post office to deliver it, but how relevant the questions in the letter still are. The sender asked, how can I know God? What does the Bible say about Jesus' return? And will an atomic bomb end the world? Might have been delivered 50 years late, but it could have been written last week. Even as we come out of a pandemic, we find ourselves in a uniquely dangerous time. Nuclear threats, environmental concerns, cyber attacks, food shortages, perhaps even another run on toilet paper. Seriously, it might happen. Is this a time for doom and gloom or bloom? And in the Bible, does Jesus offer anything that would guide us through these kinds of turbulent times? Is there a danger that we face in distressing times? Is there a human tendency in us that Jesus wants to readjust when it comes to the way we understand the distressing times in which we live. Turns out when it comes to forecasting the end of the world, there is a common trap that we can easily fall into, and Jesus wants to undo it. Today we continue our series. As I mentioned, what, what would Jesus undo? It might surprise you when it comes to predictions about the end of the world. As we know it, there is a trap that we can, use, we can easily fall into, and Jesus wants to undo that trap. Again, we're almost done with this series. Open with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 21, starting in verse 5. Luke 21, starting in verse 5. As we pick up the story, Jesus is in the final week of his ministry here on earth. He, the, he and the disciples are gathered in Jerusalem, and the disciples just make this sort of offhand comment. It's small talk, really. It's one of those things you just say when, you, when you're looking to say something, to fill the, 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 the silence. Luke 21.5 says some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. The comment seems super benign. It's sort of like you might be just commenting on the weather or the ridiculous price of gas. My, how beautiful the temple is. Jesus, great architecture, don't you think? Check out those stones. And the temple was beautiful. At the time uh, of Jesus' ministry right here, they had been constructing it for 46 years. 
It was still under construction. It was almost done. It was high on the hill, and when the sun hit it, it looked like it was just a mountain of gold because they'd used actually gold to put it together. And what at first seems like sort of small talk, this random comment about the, the, the beauty of the temple, Jesus pounces on it as an opportunity to discuss the end of the world. I mean, imagine how the disciples felt, how surprised they were when they heard Jesus' response in verse 6. It says, but Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. You think the temple's beautiful, do you? Well, don't get too attached to it. It's going to be destroyed. I can imagine one of the disciples thinking, okay, Doomer Jesus, just admiring the beautiful scene here. You don't need to get all apocalyptic on us or anything. Now, before we're too hard on Jesus for jumping all over the, this innocent comment, Remember, as I told you, this is the final week of Jesus' ministry here on earth. He is going to be crucified in exactly three days. And there's so much still that the disciples need to know. So much still that they need to be prepared for. Now, as a side note, you need to know that what Jesus predicted that day did come true. History tells us that in about three decades, in 70 AD, only seven years after the temple was finally completed, within a generation of Jesus' very words, an army set fire to the temple. The gold melted down into the stones. Eventually, every stone was taken apart as looters stole the melted gold. History verifies that Jesus' prediction was spot on. No stone was left upon another in the temple and the disciples would live, most of them, to witness it. So Jesus makes this apocalyptic prediction, and the disciples ask the natural question in verse 7. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? Now, Matthew also records this question of the disciples, and he gives us a little bit more insight into really what the disciples were asking in that moment. It reveals the heart of their concern. There in Matthew, we read these words. The disciples asked, tell us, they said, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You see what's going on, right? The disciples hear about the destruction of the temple, and they assume that it must be the end of time. Why? Because they're like us. When we hear about the threats of devastation in our lifetime, we almost always equate it with the end of the world. We almost always think that devastation in our time must mean devastation for all time. At least that's what the disciples did. They assumed that this nightmare that they would experience in their lifetime meant that Jesus was coming back at that time. It meant that the world would then be over. Devastation in our time must mean devastation for all time, as they thought about it. And Jesus knows this about his disciples. Jesus knows how devastating it will be for them to see their temple ruined. He knows that the emblem of their national and spiritual foundation being destroyed, the dwelling place of God, would devastate them. And Jesus knows that they are going to feel like this is the end of the world, this unthinkable tragedy. And he seizes an opportunity then to talk about what is and what isn't the end of the world. And right away, Jesus will now launch into identifying the very common trap that you and I face when it comes to forecasting the end of the world. Look at verse 8. He replied, Jesus replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. The trap that we are prone to fall into is this, being deceived. And Jesus wants to undo that. Again, verse 8. He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. Jesus continues in verse 9. He says, when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. 
And notice those last seven words. The end will not come right away. Apparently, wars and uprisings are not an automatic indicator that this is the end. It's as if Jesus is saying to his disciples, just imagine what's going on right here in Jesus' encounter with them as they're standing there before the temple. It's as if Jesus is saying, disciples, we don't have much time. Hear me on this. When you hear about these Roman troops coming in and descending on Jerusalem, when you hear about the soldiers advancing, try not to be frightened. It's not the end of the world. Jesus continues in verses 10 and 11. He says then, he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. Now let me put those two verses on the screen because in those two verses, Jesus outlines everything he's going to say in the rest of this chapter. Really, this becomes an outline for everything he's going to say here about human history before his return. There will be wars, natural disasters, food shortages, pestilences, that could be translated pandemics, frightening events, including persecution, and cosmic events. Now, I know at first glance, it's tempting to look at this list and say, well, bingo, there you have it. <laughs> Except, remember, Jesus sets this up by saying, watch out that you're not deceived. And do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. That's how Jesus leads into this. One translation puts it this way. Don't fall for any of that. When you hear of wars and uprisings, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. True, Jesus does end this much longer section saying that these things should remind us. How does he put it? End of uh, verse 28. He says it should remind us that our redemption is drawing near. In other words, it is getting closer, even as the Bible puts it in the book of Romans when it says this, wake up for your slumber, wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. World disaster should wake us up, remind us that this world is broken, that someday, sooner, all the time, Jesus will fix it. It is getting closer. But according to Jesus, and according to Paul, even in Romans, who wrote this in the first century, not necessarily right away. So, if it is getting closer every day, but we also know that some people in every generation thought they were living at the end of the world, but they weren't. And if Jesus' big concern for his disciples then and now was being deceived, how do we keep from being deceived? We recommend several things from the passage. First of all, remember that signs aren't the same as triggers. I think that's really important for us as believers. Remember that signs are not the same as triggers. Remember here, Jesus is trying to convince his disciples not to think that devastation in their time meant devastation for all time. In reality, the destruction of the temple would simply be a type of end time disasters. It would foreshadow, it would prefigure, it would anticipate the final conflict. Humanity trying to overthrow God. It would be a picture of what the ultimate conflict was, but not the ultimate conflict itself. As one commentator put it, the cata catastrophic first century events in Jerusalem foreshadow the even greater events that come at the end of the world. For the disciples then, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD that history verifies exactly happened, it would be the next of many recurring devastations in the world that remind us that this world is broken, that the battle is between good and evil, and that one day God will make it right. Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. When Hitler massacred millions of innocent people, many thought it was the end of the world. It wasn't. But it was a sign, it was an indicator of this conflict between humanity and God. History is full of signs, and we are less likely to be, deceived, to be deceived if we remember that signs are not the same as triggers. They simply remind us that this world is broken. 
It simply reminds us of this conflict between humanity and God, this, this conflict between good and evil that one day Jesus will make right. So why does Jesus give us these signs if they're not the exact indicator? Well, back when I was a teacher in Bible college uh, year, years and years ago, um, I had to learn how to write tests for my students. Uh, it wasn't just about presenting the material. Then I had to kind of test them to see if they were listening. My, my students' favorite test was always a true or false test, right? Because then you had like a 50% chance of getting it right, even if you weren't listening at all. The favorite is true and false. Their second favorite was multiple choice, or as they would call it, multiple guess test. After all, the answer is down there somewhere, right? It's just, you just have to, it's written there somewhere. You just have to find it. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Even if you don't have a clue of what the answer is, you get a chance that you're going to pick the right one. Unless, unless I include in the final multiple choice none of the above. It's a game changer. Then they never know. Is the answer there, staring you in, my, in your face? Or maybe it's something else that's not listed. Sometimes in life, the right answer is none of the above. And you pass the test by knowing that the other answers are close, but not it. In the end, we know that wars, natural disasters, per, per, uh, persecution, cataclysmic signs are not the final indicator that Jesus is coming. They are signs, but not the trigger. They are necessary to the plan, but not the final trumpet. And knowing that is knowing a lot. We are less likely to be deceived if we remember that signs are not the same as triggers. Secondly, we are less likely to be deceived if we remember that the season isn't the same as the day. Over the years, many people have tried to predict the exact time, date of Jesus' return, which is silly because even Jesus said he, that he didn't know the day or the hour. Instead, Jesus gives us a much better calendar. Skip down to verse 29. Jesus told them this parable. He said, look at the fig trees, or look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, springtime, you can see for yourself and know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Back then, they, they were not driven so much by clocks like we are the... They measured life in seasons, not really in time slots. We have relatives uh, visiting from Wisconsin this week with us, staying with us. They left the snow there to enjoy some San Diego spring. Summer comes earlier in San Diego, so, so did they. Now, I'm not saying the Midwest will wait longer for Jesus to return. I'm just saying it will seem longer for them. <laughs> For those who would see the end of the world like a, a giant checklist of events to tick off, and, and then the day is here, Jesus offers a very different imagery in this, in this parable, a tree blooming, budding with life. And to think of the season of Jesus' re return rather than the day of his return to me is healthier. It, it lends itself to preparedness but not panic. One of my favorite roles uh, over the years in life was when our kids were little. I used to help coach uh, Little League, and I, I get to be like the third base uh, coach at times. And, and I love that role. I, we would tell the, the players, each of the, the kids, we'd have to say, you have to watch for the signs. Watch the signs. I'm going to be there in third base giving you the signs. I, the indicator would be if I touch my nose, that means the next sign is it. And then if I touch my, the bill of my, the rim of my hat, that means steal, right? That was the indicator. Boom, boom. That was it. But knowing the sign was not enough. We also had to teach the players that they had to learn to read the situation. I could, I could tell them to steal second. There you go. But if it was a pop-up, they needed to get back. If it was a deep fly, they needed to tag up. If it was a walk, they could ease up. If, if there was a throw to second, they, be, they better slide. Signs were not enough. They needed to know the situation. And Jesus also knows that for us, signs are not enough. We also must know the season. 
And we are less likely to be deceived if we remember that the season of his return isn't the same as the day. But for many people, the biggest deception isn't seeing that everything is a trigger for the end of the world, but for many, the biggest deception will be not thinking about it at all. The final way that Jesus gives us to keep us from being deceived is to guard against the biggest deception of all, which is being distracted. I'm thinking now about how Jesus ends this this section as he deals with some very important stuff with his disciples, things that he needs them to know before he leaves the planet. In verse 34, he says this, Be careful, or your hearts will become weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. Jesus looks at his disciples, and even down the centuries to you and me, and he sees a very real danger. Instead of our hearts being eager for his return, anticipating his return, really realizing that it is closer day by day, and longing for his appearance, eager for his kingdom to win, instead instead of our hearts being uplifted, there's a real danger that they might be weighed down. Again, verse 34. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, anxieties of life. That day will close on you suddenly like a trap. One of the real dangers as we get nearer to Jesus' return is heavy hearts. And Jesus lists three things, carousing, literally wasting life, drunkenness, which is escaping life, and interestingly, anxiety, which is worrying about life too much. Life can wear us out. It can weigh us down with waste and with worry, And we lose our spiritual bearings. We lose our spiritual way. And and it's not just about how we lose sight of the anticipation of Jesus' final return where he's going to finally appear in our lives, but we, we lose track of looking for him appearing in our lives every day. And so much of end time frenzy is this spiritualized worry that can consume us and weigh us down. Perhaps it's a good time for a little self evaluation. Where are you weighed down today? Where has worry or waste threatened your spiritual alertness, made you numb to what he is doing, not only in the world, but also just in your own world, in your own life, in your own existence? We will be less likely to be deceived by Jesus' return if we guard our hearts from being weighed down from waste and worry. My senior year in high school, I started going to a church where I was taught that Jesus would come back before I was 20, or at least for sure by the time I was 22. I mean, according to them, there were signs everywhere. And you can imagine, you think about life differently if Jesus is going to come back in the next five years. You think about college, marriage, career, family, all that stuff a lot differently if Jesus is coming back before I graduate from college. But as I read the Bible and not just the headlines. I realized that Jesus wanted to undo that kind of of end-of-the-world frenzy and replace it with a healthy and resilient anticipation that would last a lifetime. Light and ready hearts, no matter what we face. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your, uh, your care for the disciples, for, for loving them enough to turn around a random comment in their lives and turn it into a profound teaching about how we are to view the devastations that we see around us in our lives, how we are to understand it in light of forever and in light of your return. And we thank you, Lord, so much for doing that with them and for, for preserving it so that, that we can learn about that too. And we pray, Lord, for your great um, developing that, that kind of healthy resilience and alertness in our lives, that we won't be deceived, but we will be ready as we think about your return. Uh, We we love you and we praise you today. We ask you to to use the gifts and the resources that are given today, both online and and in the basket, to, to help others know that we serve a God who controls history and is leading us 
towards that day that you will make it right. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.